Hello, and welcome back to season two of What Now on the Threshold of Life, Death, and Grief. And we are back for our second season of this podcast. And as usual, I'm here with my friends and colleagues. David Kennedy. And Red Keating. And I'm Julie Brown. So we decided to begin our second season interviewing a guest, Dr. Christopher Blake, who is the new medical director at Hospice Peterborough. So maybe familiar to some of you and um, will be familiar to our listeners after this episode. So we just felt like that was a great way to begin our second season, um, hearing from our new medical director and um, somebody who is uh, younger in the field, um, then our Dr. Beamish that we interviewed last season and just really interested to hear from um, Dr. Blake's perspectives. So I'm just going to do an official introduction and then we'll get right into the conversation. So Christopher Blake attended medical school at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. He completed his medical family medicine residency in Barrie through the University of Toronto. He went on to complete a year of added competency in palliative care through the University of Toronto. Chris is the current interim division lead for palliative care here at the Peterborough Regional Health Centre, and he's also the current medical director of Hospice Peterborough. His interests include public health approaches to palliative care and narrative medicine. And outside of work, Chris enjoys writing fiction and spending time with his wife and his 18-month-old son. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. Occurs to me, my son is, has grown a little older in the time since I wrote that introduction <laughs> for myself. <laughs> time flies. How old is he now? Uh, he would be about 20 months now. Yeah. So not that much older, I guess, but it, every day is a big change. He's getting there. He, he's getting there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He he used to have good red hair like yours, Red, but it's it's turned blonde over time. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we're not all that gifted. You know? some, <laughs> some, some of us are given it and some of us aren't. Uh, hi, Chris. Thank you again for coming. And um, I'm just going to start off with a little bit about uh, that youngness. I, I remember one time that Julie mentioned, I remember one time I was going for a job and 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 I was apparently appearing quite young. And, and, and they said to me, you know, you've got this face that looks like a kid. Um, how are you expecting people to take you seriously? And I said, well, I might have a young face, but when I open my mouth and I start talking, hopefully people will be able to see beyond that and see that I have, you know, a little bit of experience behind me and, and a way of being that, that sort of uh, helps them see the person to just the face. Um, and certainly uh, you are young and you look young and it is so wonderful that you are here now uh, and, and have come in to take, uh, you're not taking John Beamish's place, you are continuing the work uh, of hospice and palliative care in Peterborough, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing. And from a personal experience, I'm talking too much at this point, but um, just from a personal experience, uh, my dad died earlier this year, and, and, and Chris took care of my dad. And I tell you, we could not have asked for a better doctor, and a better experience. Um, and so how do you overcome uh, that sense that when you present, you're, you're, you're a young man, well, I, I do have the advantage these days of, of having to wear a mask for most of my work. So I can conceal at least about two thirds of my face. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would say that I do, you know, it's an interesting question because I get a lot, a lot of patients and their family members will say, how are you? How old are you anyway? Um, and I'm waiting for the day when that will stop and my my youth will just be no longer existent and I will just be an unremarkable uh, general adult. Um, and that will be an okay day too. What I would say is that I go into every encounter with a new patient uh, or and their families with uh, as open a mind as possible about the people I'm about to meet. And I try and spend a lot of time listening to who this person is and who the people around them are. And I try and meet them where they are and engage with them on a human level so that I'm not just a doctor, they're not just a patient or a family member, 
we're both just people who happen to have particular roles in this situation. And my particular role is to help guide and support them through a life limiting illness. And I think that by sort of meeting people where they are and demonstrating with words and with deeds that you can help them in certain ways that I think that the age factor um, becomes less less apparent to them. And I, they just see me as another person, just like I'm seeing them as another person with unique characteristics. And I think, uh, you know, there's opportunities. I, I often say that you, again, you have to meet people right where they are, but there's sometimes opportunities for, for humor, you know, even in the work that we do. And uh, so, you know, people ask me about my age and I will often tell them that I am, I am getting older every day. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so there's a way to, I think, take who you are and engage honestly with, with who you are and who I am and, and demonstrate to people that I'm just here to be a, a listener and a support for them. Yeah. Well, I, I can remember my father putting you on the spot and, and just said, tell me a joke. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'm not exactly sure you were expecting that, but he, uh, you came up with one, which was the best thing you could do. And so being there with him in that moment uh, as a great storyteller and telling him a joke was the best thing you could do. Um, and I think that that's true. You, you, once you start talking, you, you start to see uh, the wisdom, the knowledge and the caring beyond a young face. Yeah. How did one you, of the things how, oh, sorry. Oh, oh. I was just going to say one of the things I always think about is that I feel, you know, before I've prescribed a medication, before I've got a home care in to visit with a person, before I've done any practical things, my hope is that by the end of a consultation with patients and their families, that they're able to take a, uh, a load off their shoulders, that they're able to take a, a deeper breath. And, and I think that that's just by coming in uh, with genuine, you know, human compassion and, demonstrating that you care and that and trying to build a sense of trust so that they know that you'll be here for them and uh if you, i always feel like if i've done that right the you know the temperature should have come down in the room that there should be a new, new sense of calmness so so i always try and aspire to that but i, I apologize for interrupting you right go right ahead oh no i was i, <laughs> I was just going to go on with the next question but i think i'll leave that for either julie or david well, I think uh, that uh, one of the things, uh, Chris, that we have uh, commented around uh, often and why that age piece came up is we are so fortunate in this community to have uh, a, a real phenomenal uh, number of palliative physicians who are younger, and we're so thankful and grateful. So, But it's always interesting to me what, what got you into this stream of medicine. Um, I, I think that you know, the, the perception for many people is that this is not the area of medicine where most younger physicians want to necessarily start or be in. So maybe you could help us by giving us a little of your background in terms of what what interested you in this and why what, what brought you into this particular field? So um, I love this question um, because to me, the really interesting thing about palliative care is that I thought that this, what we do, the way that we practice, was the way that all medicine was. I was really naive when I got into medical school. Um, I came from a humanities, primarily humanities and social sciences background. My, my uh, undergraduate was a mix of biology and anthropology, largely. Um, and when I got into medical school, I kind of had this dream of you know, sitting down and having nice conversations with patients and their families and providing really holistic care. Um, and I soon found in my medical clerkships that there was not nearly the time for to provide the care that I imagined giving to people. And I was a little bit disillusioned to be truthful about the medical world. Um, and I went through a variety of different rotations and I was sort of, you know, in medical clerkship, you often talk to people about ruling in specialties that they might want to do and ruling out specialties they don't want to do. Well, I'd ruled out a lot without ruling anything in. And I was sort of at a loss as to what I would do. And 
I did a rotation in palliative care in Grimsby, Ontario with Dr. Denise Marshall, who has been a real leader in the field of palliative care and in particular in a public health approaches to palliative care and compassionate communities paradigms here in Ontario. And she uh, immediately within, you know, a few minutes of the beginning, the rotation, I'd walked into the hospice uh, before entering, I'd been asked to slip on a nice pair of slippers knitted by the volunteers there. Dr. Marshall took me into the kitchen and got me a nice uh, cup of tea and a muffin. And then we sat down and, and started talking about, yes, pain and symptom management, but also, you know, spirituality and how that affects people's uh, end of life journeys. The search for meaning and purpose and value in caring for a person at that time of their life. And over the course of the next two weeks, I really immediately sensed these were the people I've been looking for. This was the kind of care that I expected all of medicine to be providing in my naive early days as a medical first year medical student. And that really, to me, led me to realize I'd found my home uh, in medicine. And so I basically spent the remainder of my medical school career doing rotations and electives with the goal of getting to the point I'm at now of, of being a palliative care physician. I chose the residency program I did in Barrie, Ontario, because relatively uniquely among a lot of other sites, they had two, two full blocks of palliative care training in the family medicine residency. And they also gave the opportunity for us to follow our own family medicine patients who required palliative care longitudinally over the two years that we were there. So I knew there would be rich opportunities to get the training that I wanted. Um, and then I went on to do the year of added competency in, in palliative care in Toronto. And I worked all over um, the GTA, really, in a variety of different hospitals, seeing the different modes of practice there. And I think I am continually moved by the compassion and care that we're able to give people. I think when you when you enter the palliative care world as a patient or family member, I think that there's a different feeling to things right away. There's a sense that things are less rushed. There's a sense that things that people are caring for you as a complete human and looking at the care for your family as well. Um, there's just a sense, I think, that there's time and compassion. Um, and it's a different feeling, I think, to most of the rest of the healthcare system. I I never wanted to get uh, disillusioned like that again, like I was at the beginning of medical school. And I, and I think that palliative care is in some ways an antidote to a lot of the ills that, you know, that are in our healthcare system and that, that affect both providers and also patients and family members. And I'd like to touch, if I might, also, David, on your comment about young people in particular seeking palliative care. There are, to my knowledge, and I don't have hard stats in front of me, but I think there's increasing numbers of young people in medical school and residency who are interested in pursuing palliative care. Um, there is now in the last few years, a new Royal College subspecialty in palliative uh, medicine uh, through the Royal College of Physicians of Canada, Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Uh, there is the year of added competency type programs, which I took as well, which are always uh, very competitive um, to get into. Um, and there's many people who don't go through either of those dedicated training programs, but who are very interested in palliative care. And, and I think, you know, I haven't done any research on this, but I have a suspicion that it's not a coincidence that we find our healthcare system so fractured, so fragmented, so um, destabilized. Uh, we find people in more and more of a rush with less time to give to the patients and their families. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that we find our healthcare system in that situation and that medical students and residents are eager for something different. And I think that palliative care is the place that they get drawn to as a consequence of that. Wow. That, uh, that just... Um... That that just I I can't express how how wonderful it is to hear those those comments and um, and and I think those reflect uh, so much the humanity side of medicine that that is so that people are looking for in so many ways. So thank you for that. I was oh you're welcome. It's a wonderful question. I was um, even just the image of you know when you said you you went into 
that first day at the hospice and you sat down and you had the muffin and the tea and the conversation. And, and I can picture it because I, I see it happening. And when you're at the hospice Peterborough, I mean, that is, that is what you see happening is this slower pace, you know, m- meeting people, having conversations, sometimes laced with humor. And you see that person to person contact, even if it is something as simple over like a muffin or a coffee or something like that. You mentioned um, that one of your mentors, her her interest in compassionate communities paradigm, you mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Absolutely. I'll, I'll start by saying that I'm by no means uh, an expert or a specialist in this. It is an area of interest to me, but um, by my apologies to anybody listening who's more expert in this area than me. Um, but essentially, to my knowledge, the compassionate communities paradigm has really been spearheaded by um, a palliative care expert named Alan Kelleher, who has been based in Australia and the United Kingdom. I, I had the privilege of seeing him speak in uh, Hamilton as well when he was, I think, here as a visiting scholar. Um, essentially, what the compassionate compu- communities paradigm says is that a good death is everybody's business. And that means that to provide the care, compassion, dignity, and support that a person and their family really need in the last phases of their life, uh, it can't necessarily all be accomplished just through healthcare providers and the healthcare system. Um, There is a wonderful example to that point that Dr. Marshall, who I mentioned as my mentor, uh, uh, outlined in a study that was done where they looked at uh, uh, older women with heart failure and basically they asked them in an open-ended way to identify who the people were that were part of their uh, providing them with quality of life. And one of the people that they cited, these women, were the taxi drivers who took them out to their hairdressing appointments. And so that was such an interesting answer, I thought, and not something that probably a lot of people in healthcare would think about. But of course, that makes sense. If your mobility is limited and you can't get out to the place where you would usually go maybe to socialize, to get your hair done, to feel and look the way that you envision yourself, it's a huge additive to a person's quality of life to have access to that. The other thing that I always think about is, you know, if Mr. Brown down the road has to take care of his elderly wife, maybe he doesn't have the opportunity, you know, in snowy Canada here to shovel his drive. So maybe my role in that situation is just to make sure that his drive is cleared and his sidewalks are cleared. Um, Maybe it means somebody dropping off food for somebody nearby. But essentially, it's saying that we as individuals and also as a community are responsible for one another's uh, wellness. And I, and I think it's kind of like, just as it, you know, I mentioned earlier, I have a young son, just as it takes a village to raise a child, it, it takes a village really to provide care for a person in the last phases of their life. So there's individual elements, just like I outlined above in terms of all of our roles, but there's also societal elements. So that could include things like, and and uh, in Dr. Kelleher's Compassionate Communities Paradigm, they talk about, about uh, different sorts of institutional programs. And those could include things like having uh, peacetime memorial days. So basically think days designed to celebrate or, or, or venerate the, the loss of people through terminal illness, just to make it something that is understood and talked about at a societal level even talked about doing interventions like having um having uh beer coasters in a bar which said do you have a power of attorney things like that so it's basically talking about a, a whole of society mobilization where we say our schools our places of work our religious institutions certainly our hospitals our municipal uh institutions all of these would acknowledge and recognize that death and dying are a part of life. And we would uh, make space for that as a society, acknowledge it and support the people who are going through that journey. So that's a little bit of a sort of a pricey about what the compassionate communities paradigm is. And, and there are um, 
at the national level here through Pallium, there is a compassionate communities um, sort of lead uh, person through, uh, in the Pallium Palliative Care Program. And it would be wonderful one day um, if Peterborough could aspire to, you know, meet some of the criteria to become a compassionate community. That would be sort of a, a beautiful long-term goal, I think. I'm imagining, Chris, thanks for that overview of it. I'm imagining that you see that probably happening on an individual family level all the time when you're going into people's homes and meeting with them. Are you seeing that in action around you, though, in the way that we surround and support each other? Absolutely. One of the things that's so inspiring to me, you know, often uh, patients and family members will ask me, how do you do this work? You know, um, isn't it isn't it depressing? And my response to that is always the same, really. My response is that I actually find this work to be inspiring. And I, I, I find it to be um, humanizing and I find it to give me faith in humanity. Because what I see most of the time in my work is people caring for one another, people being compassionate to one another, people um, helping to support one another, even in the toughest situations. And you see, you know, love coming to bear. And so um, I see that all the time uh, between this compassion in the families that I support and, and between their families and their wider communities. And I think we were talking about how I was born in Newfoundland earlier on, I think before we started recording. And I kind of wonder sometimes if some of my disposition towards these sort of societal level aspects of palliative care is conditioned based on my upbringing and, you know, um, in Newfoundland and I didn't grow up in an outport or anything like that by any means, but certainly it, it is a place where people needed to care and need to care for one another or else it's a difficult time for everybody. It's a society in which people um, will literally give you the, the shirt off their back if you need it. will invite you into their home for dinner, if, even if they don't know you. You know, it's a community, I think, and a society that recognizes that all of our success is contingent upon one another, supporting one another. And, and so I do kind of sometimes think that that mentality is something that that um has maybe been lost a little bit in the in many parts of the you know of the 21st century um but i think it's something to aspire to again i i i do think and thank you because um i mean you open a whole area there but but one of the things that i i i would always confront when I would uh, with people and they would say to me, you know, my 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 doctor said there's nothing more or my medical advisor say there's nothing more they can do for me. And there's this sense that that when when we approach our dying, that there's the idea that that that's it, there's nothing left. And I think you just hit the word of compassion that opens the door to say, oh, my gosh, there's everything left to do. And and it's not just reliant on a medical approach. It's that holistic living and life in our humanity that engages people. And so I, and I know that people feel so helpless that, you know, what can we do? But I think if we can re-engage them in this compassionate approach to to, to life and living one another, it, it allows everybody to be a participant and to feel like okay there's lots we can do in this piece compassion is the is the piece that invites all people to be a part of whatever we are experiencing there mm -hmm. and i think that's the greatest uh wonderful gift there if i could ask one more thing there um just a little bit because you also i also heard in your in your uh bio um that you you were a student of narrative medicine. Um, would you would you explain that piece for us? Certainly, and and I think you saying that I am a student is a very nice way to phrase <laughs> it. Very accurate. It is definitely another area that I do not consider myself an expert in, but a, but a, somebody on a journey of learning. Um, Narrative medicine is an area that was developed really by Rita Sharon, Dr. Rita Sharon, 
uh, who's an internist um, and professor at Columbia University in New York. And um, essentially the, the underlying premise of narrative medicine is that by listening to the stories of patients, interpreting them, and also by sort of reflecting them back to the patients and their families, we are able to better serve them uh, in the broadest sense and in, in the medical care that they need. We're able to understand them better and provide them the care that they uniquely require. So it's a relatively, um, you know, it sounds kind of straightforward and nice, but there's a lot of, of depth uh, and intellectual rigor that underpins all of this. Um, and a lot of what's involved is learning in, in the day-to-day practice of narrative medicine, um, which I sometimes internalize as I'm working, is to think about the interactions and the dialogue that you're having with patients and their families almost in the way that you might analyze a piece of literature, be that poetry or prose or what have you. And there are tools that you know literary criticism has developed that uh, allow people to really parse and um, sort of extract the most meaningful and relevant components of of, of uh, peace uh, so as to better understand it and narrative medicine takes those skills and allows an individual uh, you know whether practicing medicine or social work or uh, what have you to uh, to really sort of understand in a deeper manner the the stories of the person in front of in front of them so for me i'm a i've always been a really keen reader i don't have as much time for it these days as i used to but um i think that all of us live life through story you know humans are storytelling beings and we all have a sense of a beginning and a middle and an ending of our lives and we project forward what we expect that middle and ending to look like and i think that when somebody's been diagnosed with a life-limiting illness aside from the physical damage that it does to the body it does damage to the story of our lives it does it it wreaks a um, an emotional damage to that story because it's destabilizing the person who has just retired and is expecting to go you know traveling around the world with their loved one that story is suddenly changed it's taken away the story that they were projecting forward and so the big i think a big question that many people wrestle with is how do i write a new story it's not the same as the one it was before but a story that still has meaning and purpose and how do i sometimes reinterpret the things that have happened in my life or the stories that I've lived through and the lessons that they've taught me, which may or may not still be relevant in the time that I'm in now. So I think what I really take from it, again, not being an expert practitioner in this area by any means, but is a uh, really um, individualistic approach to each patient that I encounter listening to their stories, asking them about who they are beyond all this medical stuff to find out what moves and drives them, what they've imagined and what they've hoped for. And then working forwards together, you know, helping to be a sort of um, ghostwriter maybe <laughs> in the future of their lives alongside them. I help give them new uh, sort of ways to view and approach what might be the next phases of their life and, and find meaning in it, um, even though their circumstances have changed. Jumping off the idea of a story, Chris, um, where do you see the future of palliative medicine going? Like, what, what, are, what are the cutting edges or what are the outer edges that you see as you look 5, 10, 15 years down the road? That's a great question, Red. Um so there are uh, um, there are a lot of advances that have been made, you know, since palliative care's inception. And to me, to look at where I would hope the next advances would come through would cause me to look at the places where I think we have the most work to do, basically. 
I think one of the areas where we have a lot of work to do is in helping people with some of the things I've talked about just now, which is basically how do you live well and meaningfully in the face of life limiting illness? There's, there are wonderful things uh, that are done through um, supportive counseling, through support of clergy or spiritual care, through support of people like me who, you know, provide um, listening and, and counseling as a person goes through their uh, journey with life-limiting illness. But, you know, certainly I know that there are still people, despite all of those best interventions and, and sometimes despite the use of, you know, uh, the best currently available antidepressant medications or, or other therapies that do suffer from demoralization, that suffer from depression, that suffer from anxiety related to their illness. And this is a, an incredible challenge, um, this existential distress um, that people face in the face of life and limiting illness. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that palliative care and palliative medicine faces. And it is interesting to know that I think certainly this is something that society is recognizing um, and the medical world is recognizing and that there is exciting uh, research going on in this area right now. So I think all the things that we're currently doing need to continue and need to be made available to everybody who would benefit from them. And there's still discrepancies, obviously, in access to the kind of services we've talked about. So that's step one. We need to make sure that everybody has access to these kinds of supports for, for facing loss and also for, for grief and bereavement afterwards. But there's probably also going to be space for new medications and new approaches to uh, the treatment of some of these issues with existential distress. When I was at Princess Margaret Hospital, they were undertaking research into the use of uh, what's called intranasal ketamine for the management of depression and anxiety associated with uh, uh, life-limiting illness, in that case, cancer in particular. Um, and there were some remarkable results for some patients. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine who is uh, part of a new psychedelic research um, consortium at University Health Network in Toronto. And they're doing work with a variety of uh, psychedelic substances, which uh, uh, typically alongside counseling and therapy, uh, which again, have shown some benefits for some patients in dealing with these kinds of issues of existential distress. So I, I do think that there is going to be a, um, a remarkable opportunity to help uh, with this symptom which is one of the most challenging things that, that we all deal with. And, and I'll be excited to see where that moves over the next 10, 15 years. My guess is it's within that kind of timeline. The other thing that I would just say is that I hope, and I think that we are seeing this trend in society, you know, getting uh, moving away just from medications and things of that nature. But I would hope that some of the things that we've been talking about this, thus far in this episode do continue to be amplified at a societal level, um, that there's more dialogue about death and dying as a society, that people are um, uh, more prepared to talk to their family members and loved ones about what their uh, wishes would be in the event that they're faced with life-limiting illness. I hope that there's more of a move towards as many communities in, in Canada and around the world as possible of having these compassionate communities where it, death and dying is is not just talked about, but it's something that we recognize that we all have a part in supporting. So I do see that in the last years, and I think there's a variety of different reasons for that, that these kind of topics are more in the public consciousness. And I think that that prevent, presents an opportunity for us to highlight how we can all collaborate together to help support people and their families at this stage of life. So those are my hopes and dreams. Uh, wow, that um, looks like there's a lot of work that's been done to this point, but an interesting and exciting future for palliative medicine coming our way. I sure hope so. <laughs> that's a one-off question. You know, after all that heaviness and all that good information, how did you end up in Peterborough? How did you pick of all the places you could live in this great country, how did you pick Peterborough? Oh, Red, there's so many different ways I could answer this question. Um, <laughs> all of them true. Uh, <laughs> um, 
so I was, uh, I'm kind of, I've always grown up in cities kind of this size. You know, I lived in St. John's, Newfoundland when I was a kid, about 115, 120,000. And then Kingston, Ontario was again, about 120,000. I kind of like that size of community, uh, partly because it does afford you the ability to form a community. You know, it is, there's more of a sense of place and, and I think shared destiny when you have a, a smaller um, community like this than in a big city like Toronto, where I was living just before coming here. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, I'd been living and working in Toronto. My my wife, um, my now wife, uh, was uh, originally from Hastings, Ontario, and she had opened her family practice in Trent Hills. And we'd been a long distance for a little bit, and uh, I decided that it was uh i'd had enough of that <laughs> and <laughs> and so i wanted i wanted uh, us to be reunited uh again and um so we were looking around for different opportunities where we could both uh live and practice in the same area um and i think hearing from her you know her drive to support her community really inspires me um and and so I was excited to try and be part of a medical community, but also a, you know, a, a local or regional community um, where I could feel like I was making a, a tangible impact. Um, and so we looked around and, and I spoke with uh, Dr. Natalie Whiting uh, here in Peterborough. And she told me a little bit about the program, the palliative medicine program here in, in Peterborough. And uh, I remember hanging up the phone and uh, turning to my uh, my then fiance, I suppose, now my now wife, and I just said to her, if I could have imagined a palliative care program and and designed sort of the perfect program for me to work in, this would be it. Um, the opportunity to provide longitudinal care to patients and their families, um, you know, at home in our palliative care unit at the hospital and in our hospice here is uh, an incredible uh, thing and uh, I think both for the physicians in our team but also for the the patients and the family members um, and just the, the wealth of resources that um, people like uh, Dr. Beamish, Dr. Whiting and others have uh, enabled to be available in Peterborough through you know uh, years and decades of advocacy um, this community is really, uh, re really lucky to have the supports that it does have. And I'm really lucky to be a part of this community and, and have the privilege of practicing here. Um, I'll also say, uh, Red, just as an aside, that my uh, my cottage is only about an hour and 40 minutes away from here. And uh, and it's on the right side of Toronto. So that also doesn't hurt. <laughs> I told you I, I, I told you I had multiple ways to answer this, all of them honest. Well, there's lots of good reasons. Well, I, I, I just, uh, I know we have the three, three of us have have commented on this so many times, but, but particularly from from my position, as I, as I come to the end of my career, and, 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 and I, I hear you, Chris, and and others like you. It's all of our physicians talk this way, and and excited about where this is going. It just it just gives me such hope and gratitude. And um, I think as a community at large, we are we are grateful for that. But I also think it's the impetus to to continue. And I I hope we can really work on on that compassionate community approach i really do hope and i know that in the past we have i've been involved in offering death cafes and trying to encourage the conversations around death and dying but i really do believe that that is a key uh, piece for for the future and the encouragement of people to to find a way to deal with with life and for me death is part of our living it's part of our life experience um and and this the more we can engage that i think the healthier things will be so i love that idea of compassionate community that as a target and i really hope that that that's a drive that that we can we can encourage to see happen 
Well, certainly, um, uh, and I am delighted to hear the enthusiasm about about that, and to hear already about the the work that you've done in terms of death cafes, which are a, a wonderful idea, which I I didn't mention in my brief pricey, but that have been implemented really well in uh, in many places. Um, and I would just say that, yeah, why don't we take this, you know, conversation as an opportunity for, uh, you know, a, uh, an open call to all those who might be enthusiastic or incited about how we can move Peterborough in the direction of being a compassionate community. You know, it's a, it's an opportunity for a lot of, you know, blue sky thinking in terms of whatever sorts of interventions or programs we could all implement, um, working again together um hopefully in a really grassroots manner to try and move us in that direction so hopefully this is a a springboard towards that 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 feels like uh that feels just even exciting to to speak about it in that way like here we are we already know it's happening in the little pockets in our community and it's kind of like a a call out right or a springboard as you say um, as we begin to wrap up the, our conversation today, Chris, circling back to your reference to narrative medicine, I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't come back to your your narrative, your story. And I, I think we'd love to hear about how has this work as part of your story changed you or influenced you and in how you approach your life? What is this work teaching you about life? Wow, what a great question. Um, well, as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm standing out in my backyard. Um, apologize, apologies if there's any road noise or anything like that. But what I'm listening to mostly in the background when I'm not listening to your questions are the birds chirping uh, up in the trees. Uh, I'm looking at the light reflecting uh, off the off the side of my house and out at the flowers. Uh, that I've planted somewhat successfully over time. Um, I'm looking up right now, it's a blue sky and there's just a few little clouds poking over the tree. Um, and I'm trying to live all of that and take all of that in as we're talking. Um, you know, I unfortunately have cared for many people my age or younger. Uh, and help support them all the way through end of life. So I know that um, the stories that we tell ourselves are not promised to any of us. Um, there's the possibility of, of uh, chronic illness, life-limiting illness, sudden death um, in any of our lives. And it's not to be morbid. It's not to be... Um, so focused just on on that, that um, we can't get on with living. But I think what this work teaches me is that, wow, we, you know, despite the challenges that we see in the world, we still have a pretty beautiful world in many cases. We, hopefully many of us have people who love us and care about us and people whom we love um and care for we have things that bring joy to our hearts we have opportunities to do good for others um we have opportunities to get outside and just listen to the birds singing and appreciate the feeling of the sun on the side of your face um i'm not gonna pretend that i'm uh some sort of enlightened individual <laughs> who who also doesn't scroll on the internet and you know um fritter away my time on things that probably could be better spent elsewhere. But um, I think the recognition and the realization that life is precious and life is something to be celebrated and lived to the fullest is something that I try and take from my work. And I try also not to get too hung up on, um, on small differences uh, of opinion or conflicts um, when really, you know, there's so much more that unites us and that brings us together. Um, and as I say, you know, the, the predominant 
thing that I see displayed in patients and their families when they're going through life limiting illness is love and care for one another. So to me, amidst all of the sort of strife and distress that we see on the cable news or on the internet these days, I suppose, um, palliative care is a, is a welcome reminder about the goodness in all of us and about the importance of, of remembering death so that we can live life fully. Well, isn't that lovely? <laughs> that Beautifully. Was so well said. Beautiful. Said, I'm sitting here and I've been so, I don't know if you're feeling very uplifted throughout yes. this conversation, feeling incredibly light in heart. Um, and and the, the the phrase that kept going through my mind was, well, there's a doctor behind that human, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that, that you've led with humanity as opposed to the intelligence that you clearly have and the skill that you we know you have, but that um, there's a doctor behind that human. And uh, that was a phrase that just kept rolling through and how fortunate we are here in Peterborough at hospice and, and in palliative care uh, to have that kind of a philosophy and that kind of approach uh, to the work that you do. It's just incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. It's mm -hmm. been a, it's been an incredibly um, rejuvenating uh, opportunity for me whenever I get the chance to, um, you know, talk with people of like mind on these topics reminds me of why I do the work in the first place. And, uh, and thanks so much red for that, um, doctor behind the human comment. I think, uh, my goal always is to just show up as a human and who happens to be a doctor. <laughs> and, uh, and if that came through, then I'm delighted. Yeah, thank you all so much for the time. The yeah. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. It Thanks. definitely came through loud and clear. What a wonderful way to start off our season two with our, um, with this conversation. And I agree, Red, just that feeling of upliftment from it. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to What Now? on the threshold of life, death, and grief. What Now? is produced in partnership with Hospice Peterborough. Music by Paradise Garage. Technical support provided by Sean and Jonah Heikert. What Now? is recorded at Thin Spaces Studio. You can find more episodes of What Now? for free on most major podcast platforms, including Spotify, CastBox, Apple Podcasts, and Overcast. If you want to support us, please follow and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends, it does make a difference.